Hey Wisecrack, Jared here, and today we're taking a fresh look at the 1995 classic that seamlessly combined mind-bending metaphysical themes and cartoon boobs, Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, we know there's a new version out, but apparently they forgot to put in a lot of the brainy stuff, so we decided to talk about the original. Many have weighed in over the years on what the film says about the line between human and machine, but that's not what we're talking about today. Instead, we're going to examine the film's warning about humanity's potentially fatal flaw and its roadmap for a more evolved civilization. Ghost in the Shell is probably one of the most philosophically complex animated films out there, so big shout out to Naruto Online for sponsoring this video and supporting us as we tackle this cultural milestone. Since some of the philosophy we'll be covering can get a bit confusing, stick around till the end to hear us explain a key lesson using the world of Naruto. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Ghost in the Shell, and as always, spoilers ahead. Ghost in the Shell had a huge impact on sci-fi. Works such as Ex Machina, The Matrix, and Westworld echo not only the film's aesthetics, but also the theme of mankind versus technology. We often see this as a warning that technology will take over and or alter humanity for the worse. And I'm not talking about clickbait or selfies. I'm talking about this. The machines had found all the energy they would ever need. And this, you know, classic robot overlord stuff. However, Ghost in the Shell is different. While it's set up to be a typical battle between man and his creation, the resolution is not one side triumphing over the other, but a synthesis between the two. Don't remember? Can't blame you, it's probably been a while, but here's a quick refresher. The film centers around Major Motoko Kusanagi, a cyborg government agent working for Section 9, basically a black ops unit. Section 9 pursues a mysterious entity known as the Puppet Master, who employs ghost hacking to monkey around with people's memories and force them to do its bidding. Do you even know who you are? Ghost hacked humans are so pathetic, it's a shame. And this poor bastard's been hacked pretty badly. This super hacker turns out to be a spy program originally called Project 2501, which was secretly developed by Section 6. They're an intelligence division sort of like the CIA. Section 6 lost control of their creation after it spontaneously developed self-awareness by swimming in the vast ocean of the digital world. When Kusanagi finally catches up to the Puppet Master, it makes a rather forward proposal. I want us to merge. Merge? That they should merge consciousnesses and create a new unique being. She accepts, and the film ends with a new entity, call it the Kusanuppet Master, contemplating what to do next. Maybe a vacation? The confrontation and resolution of these two forces, human and digital consciousnesses, reflects German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's vision of progress. Yeah, <laughs> what a name. To Hegel, conflict progresses human history. Every development from the time of our illustrious forefathers to the present day is caused by forces that clash and create something new. This is Hegel's dialectics in a nutshell. But before we get into that, we need to show how Hegel's fundamental ideas help build the setting of Ghost in the Shell. First and foremost, Hegel's philosophy is driven by the belief that the world operates on rational principles and that the true nature of reality is knowable. Kusanagi is defined by this philosophical idealism. She is driven by dissatisfaction with her limited perspective. Any way you look at it, all the information that a person accumulates in a lifetime is just a drop in the bucket. And is convinced that there is a more perfect reality available to her. As such, the film treats the marriage of Kusanagi's human consciousness and the Puppet Master's artificial nature with a certain optimism, and Hegel's system of dialectics explains why. But first, I want to distinguish Hegel's dialectics from the way the term is more commonly understood. In classical philosophy, dialectics are a form of argumentative discourse designed to ferret out contradictions and arrive at a better understanding of truth. You start with an argument called a thesis, which is met by a counterargument called an antithesis. The end result may be either a refutation of the original idea, an affirmation of the counterargument, or a synthesis of the assertions that results in a better understanding of the subject. Think Socratic method or a lawyer cross-examining a witness. The purpose is to learn the truth. In Hegel's system, dialectics is more than just philosophical inquiry. They are the very mechanism by which humans progress, both on an individual level and and as a collective, when one force confronts another force, something new ultimately emerges. At the heart of the film is a dialectic of the human and digital worlds. In the one corner, we have Kusanagi and her human mind, 
Her various memories and experiences combine to make her a unique individual, and yet she feels constrained by her own limited personal identity. Each of those things are just a small part of it. I collect information to use in my own way. All of that blends to create a mixture that forms me and gives rise to my conscience. I feel confined, only free to expand myself within boundaries. In the other corner, we have the Puppet Master, who sprang forth from the vast informational resources of cyber reality and therefore possesses the broader understanding that Kusanagi seeks. But the Puppet Master too feels limited by its lack of personal identity. I refer to myself as an intelligent life form because I am sentient and am able to recognize my own existence. But in my present state, I am still incomplete. I lack the most basic life processes inherent in all living organisms, reproducing and dying. In short, each has what the other needs. Other films have us trained to think that when technology gets a little too big for its britches, it needs to be put in its place so humanity can be preserved. But through the lens of Hegel's master-slave dialectic, this meeting of the minds should have no winner. Imagine a feudal lord of the Middle Ages and the serfs bound to work his fields. The lord is the master. He can force the serfs to toil away because he controls all the agriculture in the area. The serfs are his slaves, peasants who can't afford land of their own. They work their asses off while the lord sits back with a refreshing drink. Sounds great for the lord, right? Well, the problem is, as the serfs labor, they become better at better at farming, while the master learns nothing new. He stagnates, while the serfs become more powerful due to their valuable knowledge. This, according to Hegel, is what leads the oppressed to overcome their masters. Still not making sense? Well, stick around to the end to hear it explained in the context of Naruto. Examples of oppressive masters and usurping slaves resonate throughout Ghost in the Shell. So what's the latest on your puppet master? He's only a puppet himself. Section 6, ostensibly pulling the puppet master's strings, remains antiquated, stagnant, and stuck in the politics of the old world. I'm submitting a formal complaint about this through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They preserve some power through their mastery of Project 2501, but gain nothing while the puppet master slowly gains sentience as it labors for them. Them. Separately, the Puppet Master acts as a master when it uses its ghost hacking ability to hijack others and force them to do its bidding. We see this early in the film when Section 9 interrogates the garbage man and learns that he was brainwashed into believing that he was spying on his wife, when in fact, he was merely the Puppet Master's tool. What's a simulated experience again? But the Puppet Master's efforts are constantly thwarted, and it remains unable to escape the terms of its bondage. Similarly, Section 9's typical MO is classic master behavior. They use lethal force to accomplish their goals, leaving no room for compromise. The first time we see Batu, he's bragging that Section 9 has the authority to kill. We're the ones who get our hands dirty. And Aramaki's approach to the Puppet Master is to destroy it if Kusanagi can't secure it. If you're unable to retrieve the Puppet Master, your orders are to destroy it without fail. Ultimately, none of this is productive. It just makes it harder for Section 9 to understand the Puppet Master's true nature and prolongs Kusanagi's journey to enlightenment. The preferred result when two opposing forces clash is synthesis, which Hegel refers to as sublation. He means something very specific here. It's combination without loss. The result is a unique, superior idea that incorporates and accommodates both perspectives. That's what the Puppet Master is proposing when he suggests that he and Kusanagi merge. We will both undergo change, but there is nothing for either of us to lose. A cyborg is a great example of this. A cyborg is neither wholly man or machine. It's a synthesis of man and machine. Encompassing both, it becomes something new. Sublation is crucial because it helps avoid the stagnation that occurs when a person, idea, or whatever becomes too insulated. Looking at Section 9, we see that the team was composed with dialectical principles in mind. When Togusa asks Kusanagi why he, a non-augmented human, is included on the team of cyborg badasses, Kusanagi explains that his uniqueness makes the group stronger. If we all reacted the same way, we'd be predictable, and there's always more than one way to view a situation. What's true for the group is also true for the individual. It's simple. Over-specialize and you breed in weakness. It's slow death. 
The Puppet Master 2 is aware of the problem of stagnation, and that's why he needs the constraints that Kusanagi feels fettered by. Life perpetuates itself through diversity, and this includes the ability to sacrifice itself when necessary. Cells repeat the process of degeneration and regeneration until one day they die, obliterating an entire set of memory and information. Only genes remain. Why continually repeat this cycle? Simply to survive by avoiding the weaknesses of an unchanging system. This is reminiscent of a species from another classic series, the Borg from Star Trek. The Borg are an awesome villain, and I'd use pretty much any excuse to bring them up, but they actually illustrate what we're talking about pretty well. The Borg is a cybernetic race that travels the galaxy, assimilating other species into a collective mind. Why do they do this? We wish to improve ourselves. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service ours. It's the same reason. Without diversity, the weaknesses of the race will inbreed and compound, rendering their civilization vulnerable. Obviously, from the perspective of the assimilated, there's some loss. The Borg gets your smarts and fresh genetic material, and all you get is a new, modern look. But from the perspective of the Borg, it's a story of developing consciousness. Captain, they've adapted! Sublation is the climax of Ghost in the Shell. Not a battle to the death, but rather a synthesis that results in a stronger, more evolved being. Because I am now neither the woman who was known as the Major, nor am I the program called the Puppet Master. For Hegel, the progress of human history happens through conflicts like these, both on an individual level and on a much larger scale. Every time we make any kind of advance through these dialectics, be it in science, art, or what have you, the world enters a new state of affairs that should represent an improvement over what came before. Hegel calls this new state Geist. The word can be translated as mind, spirit, or even, and wait for it, ghost. So, Geist in the shell, anyone? At the end of the film, after Kusanagi and the Puppet Master have merged, we have a new state of affairs in which this type of being exists. Call it a new era, call it evolution, call it what you will. It's Geist following its trajectory toward an improved world. The film hints at this in the climactic battle scene, when tank fire obliterates the names of less evolved creatures in the Tree of Life stopping at the top on hominids. This symbolizes that evolution must continue even past human beings. This is why Ghost in the Shell's message is so unique from other films in the genre. It's not about what will happen if we do merge with our technology, it's what will happen if we don't. The message is to interact with the world, resolve our contradictions with it, and emerge stronger than we were before. Clinging to our beliefs about what we are will only prevent us from becoming what we can be. I want to guarantee that I can still be myself. There isn't one. Why would you wish to? All things change in a dynamic environment. Your effort to remain what you are is what limits you. Put another way, resistance is futile may sound bad coming from the Borg, but according to Hegel, sublation is a necessary step towards progress. So it just may be true. Stay cool, Wisecrack. Peace. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Still a bit confused about Hegel's master-slave dialectic? I don't blame you, Hegel is pretty freaking difficult. But luckily, if you're a fan of Naruto, I've got another way to explain it. Keep in mind, this scenario is entirely hypothetical. Let's start at the beginning. Naruto desperately wants recognition from the people of the Hidden Leaf Village by becoming Hokage, or the master ninja of the village. Let's say that Naruto uses sweet jutsus and the nine-tailed fox spirit to force people to make him Hokage. By coercing the villagers to submit to him, Naruto has gained mastery over them. In Hegel's terms, they will have become Naruto's slaves or bondsmen. Well, the problem is, just because he's now Hokage, that doesn't mean he actually has the skills. That doesn't occur until hundreds of episodes later after he defeats Pain. In fact, at this point, the villagers would have no choice but to do the bulk of the protecting and ninja duties while Naruto just sits back and takes all the credit. In other words, if the people are having to fight invaders, build defenses, and craft weapons, then they are the ones gaining the skills becoming of sweet, sweet Hokage-ness. Essentially, Naruto will never get any better at being Hokage while his subordinates are becoming more and more skilled at the art of defense. So even though in this hypothetical situation Naruto would be the Hokage, his claim to mastery is slowly dissipating as the villagers come to master the skills that supposedly define his role as Hokage. So who's the master and who's the slave? Thanks again to Naruto Online, the officially licensed RPG by Bandai Namco, for helping make this video possible. And some of us around Wisecrack have been playing Naruto Online for days. 
It's got really intuitive gameplay and animation that feels like you're in the anime. It has all the staples you'd expect out of an RPG. Turn-based combat, character progression, a storyline that remains pretty faithful to the anime, and some damn amazing cutscenes. Creating your own shinobi, running around with your arms behind your back, leveling up, learning kick-ass jutsus, and creating a battle team from the classic Naruto characters is entertaining as hell. It's browser-based and free to play, so be sure to check it out at the links in the description. And if you want to play with one of our writers, Matt, his username is Gino Rain. The server he's on is in the description too, so if you run into him, tell him I said yo. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified when we upload new stuff. Thanks guys, peace.